Hello and welcome to today's CID speaker series. I'm Kevin, a freshman at Harvard College. Today's discussion is on doing research at the intersection of development, economics, and political economy with Professor Jia Wen. The format for today's discussion is a 20 to 25 minute presentation and around 20 minutes of Q&A. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. During the Q&A, you can submit questions directly in the chat that I will read out loud to Professor Wen. We're also recording today's session. The video of this event will be available on the CID YouTube channel. Please do check it out. And our next speaker series is on Friday, April 8th at our normal time of 12 p.m. with Professor Robert Lawrence on the topic of manufacturing and inclusive growth. We hope you join us. But without further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our speaker for today. Professor J.L. Wen is an assistant professor in the business, government, and the international economy unit at Harvard Business School. Professor Wen's research focuses on issues in development economics, political economy, and firm behavior. Thank you for all for being here. And Professor Wen, over to you. Thanks so much for the intro, Kevin. And thanks all of you for being here. Um, let me just share some slides I've prepared for today. So I wanted to keep today's discussion at a pretty high level and share part of why I'm so excited about development economics in general, and then why the intersection of development and political economy is uh, something that I'm really passionate about. So let me just start off here. So Perhaps one of the core questions of development economics would be this question of what drives global inequality. And one way of measuring global inequality is to look around the world and think about what the GDP per capita is across countries. And what you see here is that, of course, as you all know, there is a huge amount of cross-country income dispersion, right? And this isn't even a linear graph, right? The dark blue is orders of magnitude larger than the light yellow and greenish yellow color schemes for per capita GDP. So it's a great mix history of huge human consequences, why some countries are rich and others are poor. So let's get down to it. What drives global inequality? What have we learned from the field of development economics? And this question of income differences across countries, the macro accounting literature, the development accounting literature, has actually helped break down the big drivers for us and helped us think about the question from the top down. So uh, just to keep our thoughts organized, let's consider the aggregate production function. Now, some of us may have already seen this in our classes and some of us may be new to this idea, but essentially what this equation is telling us is that Y, which is output or GDP, all the things that something a country makes, is going to be created from some function of all the stuff that we have in terms of inputs, right? And the way that those inputs are combined, right, those inputs include K capital, could be physical capital, for example, the computer sitting on my desk or the machines in the factories, and it takes human capital, H, and then how many hours people work. So traditionally, we would have the physical capital and the human capital, and these two key inputs are combined through some functional form, and then they create output. And then there's this other term in this, in this equation that captures this idea of productivity, which is that sometimes when we combine capital and labor, something magical and invisible happens to either amplify or dampen that combination process. And that's what we call productivity. So basically what this equation is just telling us is some inputs are combined and then transformed into output. That's all you need to know. So what have we learned? So a lot of very smart macro development folks have tried to understand, is it that rich countries just have more capital or more human capital, or is there something else that leads to rich countries being richer, right? So what this literature has told us is that about 20% of global income differences across countries seem to come from differences in physical capital in those countries. So what we mean is that Sweden just has more machines and computers than India has per capita. But that only explains 20% of the variation, right? So let's consider other uh, drivers, right? So another big chunk of drivers is human capital. 
right? And that's going to depend on education. It's going to depend on health and uh, how much nutrition you're able to eat. And it turns out that these uh, development accounting folks have said probably up to 30% of this cross-country income difference is due to differences in human capital, right? And that's going to depend on education systems and access to food and all of these things, right? But you might be adding these numbers up and saying, well, OK, so there's 100 percent to be explained and we've only explained less than 50. What that tells us is that over 50 percent of cross country income differences is actually due to this thing called productivity. When we think about that deep question of development economics, why are some countries rich and others poor? We should be talking about why are some countries more aggregately productive than other countries, right? But okay, what on earth is productivity? I mean, before I took my second year courses, I hadn't really thought about this term. It seems like a nice thing, but what is it? Well, productivity, like I just told you, mathematically, it just tells us how those inputs are amplified when they're being combined into output. And there's two types of things that determine aggregate productivity. So um, what does the production in a society? Well, it's the firms. In an economy, the firms do the producing. And there's two types of ways that firm productivity can be translated and trickle up into aggregate productivity, right? The first thing is that average, on average, firms can be more or less productive within a country. And it can also be the case that firms within a country have greater variance or dispersion in their productivity. So some, you might have some amazingly productive firms, but some amazingly unproductive firms, and that's going to decrease your overall country's aggregate productivity. So these are basically levels and variance, right? Okay, so let's actually get a little bit concrete, though. What then determines productivity? You know, what, what, what should I think of in my head? Well, a big one is technology. And what drives technology and technological change is innovation, research, development. So technology is a big one that determines A. Technology across countries may be different. Another big force that could determine productivity is things like infrastructure, you know, financial infrastructure, physical infrastructure, all of the things that make it easier to do business and to engage in trade or to produce, right? This might even be institutions. Another set of things that could determine productivity within firms and across countries is management and leadership. You know, management and leadership, neither of these are really physical capital or human capital, right? It's just how are these things being combined within firms to create stuff, right? If you've ever had a good boss, you know exactly how amazing a good boss can be in upping your productivity and output. But there may be other drivers. And one of the drivers that I'm hoping to dedicate my career to studying is political incentives, political economy, and the incentives of the state and how they might shape productivity. So what do I mean by that? And, and why do I think political economy matters a lot? Well, let's think about the economy. You know, economies don't exist in a vacuum. States are actually the bodies that make and enforce the rules of the economic game. All economies take place within a polity, within a political economy. And what that means is that the state and what the state wants to do might actually shape how markets act and how they take place in terms of transactions. So let's let's be a little bit more concrete. States have their own objective functions. States and governments want to do something and they're maximizing that thing that they want to do. And they're going to change all the rules of the game to help them stay in power. And what we know and what seems from first principles logic quite clear is that the governments around the world don't just maximize GDP. That's definitely part of what they care about, but they're not just machines that maximize GDP. They care about a lot of other things, right? Governments actually maximize the chances of staying in power. And economic outcomes are clearly a component of that across different political systems, democracies, autocracies, and anocracies. You definitely need to get good economic outcomes to stay in power, get reelected, et cetera. But that is only a component of staying in power. There are other drivers of staying in power that don't actually necessarily align perfectly with maximizing GDP, right? Those things could be 
maintaining social stability, um, making sure that the environment is protected, that there's clean air and clean water. There could be sort of social legitimacy things where you want also the people that you are in charge of to feel that you have um, the right to rule and that you're the right government to be in charge of this country. And all of these things sometimes align with maximizing GDP, but sometimes they don't. And where they diverge, you might see certain trade-offs emerging. And that's how political economy might intersect with development. So let me give you one example of this phenomenon from my own research, right? So um, one of my papers is about state-owned enterprises in China. And the first thing that we know is, you know, the Chinese government really cares about GDP growth. You know, there's, there's no denying that, especially if you look at the sort of last 40 years, right? But a big part of the Chinese economy is state-owned enterprises. And something interesting about state-owned enterprises is that they are substantially less productive than private firms. Depending on how you measure the process that you use to calibrate productivity, SOEs in China are a quarter to even a half less productive than their private counterparts. That's a huge amount of productivity sitting on the table. The government could say tomorrow, I want these guys privatized and productivity would likely go up. But it seems like the government has not done that. So since the initial wave of privatization in 97 and 98, privatization has stalled in China, especially since 2004. And in fact, in recent years, the share of state-owned enterprises in the economy by a host of different measures is actually increasing. So this sort of raises a question, you know, um, the Chinese government should care very deeply about GDP growth. So why are they keeping around these unproductive firms that in fact represent a huge part of the economy? So they represent about a fifth of all urban employment, right? That's a huge number of people, 70 million people, bigger than many countries. Well, I'm going to argue and, and hopefully persuade to you that it could be that SOE jobs are actually also a tool for unrest mitigation. What do I mean by that? Well, SOEs are not just firms. We can't think of them as only firms. They might actually serve other roles in society like maintaining stability, right? And if they do serve as a combination of a firm and a policy tool for maintaining stability, maybe the government is saying, okay, maybe it's all right, they're less productive because they are serving my objective function of staying in power through other means than GDP maximization. So let's use our econ toolkit to think of how we might test this question, right? So are SOE jobs an unrest mitigation tool? Well, uh, the basic relationship that I would hope to establish is when there's sort of a threat of unrest, do I see SOE employment going up, right? But of course, I can't just correlate those two things because I'm going to face some empirical challenges. One is that lots of different drivers can change you know, SOE employment. And I'm going to have to persuade you that a response that I find is really about unrest mitigation and not some other motive. For example, um, you know, pollution mitigation or even profit maximization. And then of course, and I'm sure all of you in the audience know about this, the challenges of causal identification. Because even if I find that SOE employment rises after some sort of unrest event, there could be some third factor that's actually driving both of these things. So I'm going to have to work hard to make a causal claim here. So what do I do in, in one of my papers? Well, I study how SOE employment responds to ethnic unrest threats. And why do I choose ethnic unrest threats? Well, unlike other types of shocks or, or bad events that firms might face, ethnic unrest threats are explicitly political in nature. And I'm not looking, for example, at unrest that actually happens, only the potential to happen. So we're not going to get real changes in the ability of firms to produce, for example. Nothing is being destroyed. There's no actual conflict. And so here I can really nail down that mechanism of, okay, unrest is what these jobs are supposed to mitigate and respond to. 
And then on the side of causality in the paper, I use this triple difference shifter to generate unrest threats. And then I see how firms respond. And the triple differences are that I use time variation in a regional conflict, the, the movement of those incidents over time. And then I interact those incident time series with where the diaspora of that ethnic group lives outside of that region, right? So I have a shift share. And then I focus on labor market outcomes for male minorities relative to everybody else. And the reason I do that is because it happens in this context and across many contexts, the most likely additional participant joiner in an ethnic conflict are, of course, people who are a member of the ethnic groups that are fighting, but also by gender, there's a stark difference. Males are more likely to participate in these kinds of conflicts. And so what I do is I have this generated thread of instability, and then I look at who the government might most likely be concerned about and therefore give jobs to. So I've talked a lot at you. What do I actually find? Well, I find that accordance with this hypothesis I put forward, that when there are these ethnic unrest threats, SOE employment rises. And SOE employment of male minorities rise relative to everybody else. And then when I think about the labor market, SOE employment is happening within a broader labor market. So there are actually general equilibrium implications for when one group of firms starts to hire more and more. And if you think back to Econ 101, what, what happens when you have labor demand going up? Equilibrium wage should go up because you know demand is shifting upward. And in fact, in the data, it's exactly what I see. I see male minority wages going up in response to these threats as well. And then finally, one more general equilibrium outcome is, okay, so what happens if my wage goes up? Well, private firms are going to say, wow, now I have to pay a higher wage to hire male minorities. So maybe I'm actually going to scale back my hiring of that group a little bit because of this wage effect. And that's also exactly what I see. So I find overall that SOE employment is increasing in response to threats, which supports the hypothesis. And then just as Econ 101 would tell us, all of these other outcome variables behave in this really disciplined way. So I think that's kind of fun. I was like, oh yeah, you know, demand curves, they actually slope downward, that's cool. All right, I also have some additional results in the paper. I'm like, okay, so ethnic conflict is like really, really specific context, but there are plenty of other things that can drive instability. So for example, a bad trade shock might cause layoffs and that might lead, lead people to protest because they're unemployed and frustrated. Um, it might also be the case, for example, that after a natural disaster, if people's homes and livelihoods are destroyed, that may make them more likely to participate in protests. And, and what do I see in the, in the data is this interesting pattern that also after bad trade shocks and natural disasters, SOE employment rises. And there are other explanations for that, but in general, it looks like SOE employment is not just about profit maximizing for the firm. It's also about this social stabilizing role, the mitigation of unrest, which is a different objective that the government has. All right, so basically the takeaway that I would like to have from this particular piece of my work is that governments might actually tolerate unproductive firms if they buy something else the governments care about, like social stability. And when we think about what governments care about, GDP is not everything. All right, so I wanted to save lots of time for the Q&A, and I'm happy to answer questions from folks who are currently in undergrad thinking about grad school, you know, folks who are in grad school trying to generate research ideas, and really anything else. So um, let me just open it up to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Professor Wen. Thanks so much for such a enlightening presentation. It's really cool to see uh, the effects of political and uh, non-economic factors in like companies like SOC in China. So we're going to open up for Q and A now, and uh, everybody in the audience, feel free to add questions to the chat uh, so that I can at least uh, read out your questions. But just to start with, um, I do have a question myself. Uh, so. My question is about these SOEs raising employment in face of ethnic unrest. 
are these decisions made consciously and centralized decisions or are they kind of decentralized uh, different company act for themselves in some sort of unison uh, interest? That's a fantastic question. And um, from the reading that I have done of the qualitative evidence, it seems that it's a delegated decentralized process. So the, the best of my understanding is that in times the center and the provincial governments are always concerned about maintaining stability. You can see that in a lot of the ways that they reward and punish bureaucrats. So for example, if you are able to maintain um, no protests in your jurisdiction as a county leader and high GDP growth, then you get promoted very fast. So you can tell that the center and the provinces always care about unrest. And I think what's happening is that the local government officials look around and they might be in certain times more concerned about threats of unrest um, turning into real unrest. And so they have connections, close connections with SOEs in their jurisdiction, and they will make a phone call um, and say, hey, you know, it would be great if you could hire up some of these folks. Uh, we don't really want them to be unemployed right now. Um, and I, I think that it's it's that sort of delegation process that's happening. Great. Um, I have one question from the uh, audience, from Carlos Patricus. So the question is, uh, is this similar, is this phenomenon of SOEs and high in, uh, increased employment in unrest, is this similar to how many emerging countries where the ruling political party will increase bureaucracy as soon as they win, uh, support, uh, win elections to buy or reward political support? Right, that's a that's a fantastic question. So um, the there's two types of allocation of jobs within that literature. There's after you win power, the allocation of jobs to your supporters as a reward for supporting you, a sort of patronage or a clientelistic mechanism. And then there's a sort of inverse of that, which is that sometimes parties who are in power will try and allocate jobs before an election to try and shore up support in marginal areas or bases of support. And in, in both of those dynamics, both the patronage side and the sort of political business cycle side, one key principle that I think is really fascinating is, again, you see governments doing things that have ramifications economically, not to maximize GDP or productivity, but in order to maximize their chances of staying in power. So in that case, I think one through line between that literature and, and my work and how I think about it is it's a great example of leaders and governments doing things to maximize what uh, they want to do, which is get reelected, and that's going to have downstream economic implications. And I also want to say that another really interesting interaction here is that um, public sector jobs uh, are sometimes not recorded as part of firm productivity. But SOEs are this fascinating intersection where, on one hand, the government has a lot of influence over how those jobs are allocated. So in, in some sense, they may al always like, may already simil be similar to jobs in a bureaucracy, but on the other hand, they're still part of a productive unit and they still show up in firm surveys and they're still making stuff in firms. And so actually um, it may artificially make certain countries productivity look lower because some things that might usually just fall under public employment and not be counted toward firm surveys or toward GDP is actually rolled into firm surveys and GDP. So I think those literatures are fascinating and um, I think they have like great connections to the big ideas that I think about. Another question about the SOE from the audience. Um, is this phenomenon uh, only uh, in SOEs in the manufacturing sector? I do think uh, financial SOEs are not in the scope or less influence. I guess to rephrase the question, um, is there, do we see this phenomenon, phenomenon stronger in certain types of SOEs than others? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, as you know, all research empirical research relies on the existence of data. And one reason that I focus on 
manufacturing firms is that that is actually where we have very rich micro data in the Chinese context. So I can answer this question in two parts. So specifically the financial services sector, I don't have employment data on in a time varying way. And so I can't answer that question directly. But within the data that I have, I can subdivide manufacturing into, uh, sorry, I should actually revise that statement. So there's a really good micro level manufacturing survey, but within the household data that I use, I can actually look at all different types of sectors. And that is actually going to include financial services sectors, right? Um, I don't have sectors that are that fine, but they would show up under sort of broad high skill services. And what I find is that when I look at this effect and what SOEs are responding by sector most, it actually seems to be there in manufacturing, but not the highest, there in mining and construction, but not the highest. It's actually services that respond the most elastically to this threat. And the large majority of services, particularly in China, just in terms of magnitude, it's going to be things like restaurants, it's going to be things like hotels, it's going to be things like um, custodial services that clear the streets. And so those are the sectors that seem to be absorbing many of the male minorities hired in response to these threats. And if you think about it, I mean, ex post, it seems potentially reasonable in that those might be the sectors that are sort of have the lowest turnover costs, the lowest onboarding costs. You can show up and start sweeping a street and you don't need a particular set of specific skills. Now, financial services are going to be in the services category, but they're going to be a vanishingly small you know, component in terms of magnitude. So I really doubt that they would be driving the results, although empirically, because of data limitations, I can't explicitly explore that. We have one question from Nikhil about data collection, actually. Um, how do we get data related to institutional mechanisms from bureaucracies when studying these questions? Data related to institutional mechanisms. So I'm, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about what the questioner had in mind, but if I'm just gonna interpret what we have now, it's like how, how do we figure out how institutions work when typical data sets don't have a variable that say like, I made a phone call to this guy or that we should hire these people more. I mean, these aren't, these aren't variables that you would see in a firm data set or in a, you know, a government data set. And what I would say is that um, this is the power of using qualitative and quantitative research in conjunction. So um, before I even ran regressions in this project, I just read, a lot of political science work, a lot of um, history on how the Chinese government works, how they think about issues, what they say their priorities are. And they're very open about GDP is not everything that we care about. We care about plenty of other things. And of course, then the question is, okay, is that just rhetoric or do we see the shadow of that rhetoric in the quantitative employment data, right? And so I think that my answer to that question is combine all types of research, right? Combine the qualitative research, leverage the comparative advantage of other disciplines to help you understand how a system works, and then use your comparative advantage as an economist to shore up those claims with data or to test those hypotheses in a causal way. So, I would say that a lot of times we want to talk about things that are not explicitly measured or very hard to measure, and that's part of the art of doing quantitative research. Um, Thomas has a question that, so China has embarked on a number of SOE reform phases over the last 20 years. Uh, would, you, would be your contention that this reform are in some way public management exercises? How does the political economy balance what some citizens see as corruption, which would delegitimize the CCP versus meeting the employment goals that you have covered? Is public perception important to the Chinese state? Well, the, the answer to the last question is yes. Um, I think there's a bunch of questions baked in in there. Um, are, is SOE reform an exercise in, sorry, it was an exercise in what was the question? Um, in some way, a public management exercise. Like a 
public relations management. Sorry, I, I, I'm going to interpret this question in the best way that I, I, I know how. I think. I think that Thomas here is able to speak. If you would like to clarify your question, feel free to unmute. That would be really helpful. Hi, Thomas. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent, super. So, um, I mean, I think the question is essentially, yeah, it is PR, right? Um, so we're talking about all these reforms that you know have been announced um, through various phases, and then thinking through, and a number of them have been in response to either. Um, a shakeup within the kind of within the SAE sector in terms of this um, exposure in terms of just kind of the mismanagement that's taking place. And so then there's a commitment um, basically to make them more productive, more um, profitable, uh, make sure that no money is being wasted, right? And so I'm just kind of trying to figure out how the state balances um, the perception of corruption versus the employment goals. Thanks, that's a really great question. And thank you for helping me understand it better. So let me just focus on the first big wave of SOE privatization from 1997-8 to about 2002, right? So let's just pause there and say, um, what can we learn from the data about the motives behind that wave of SOE reform? And I would say that from what we see in the data, what were the big consequences of that reform? Well, first, it seems that one big consequence is that these firms indeed that are privatized appear to become more productive. So even if it wasn't the only intent, there clearly is some improvement in productivity in those firms. And there's like plenty of great papers that dig into that. Now, there's another set of consequences, which is that after those SOEs were privatized, there's this phenomenon called the breaking of the iron rice bowl, right? So um, one characteristic of many of these SOEs is that um, you would work there for your whole life. You know, they would, uh, your coworkers would become your friends. You know, you would go there for every New Year's festival. You would even get like gifts from your workplace and um, you would have really good pension benefits. And so it wasn't just a job, it was also a very stable job that gave you a certain social standing and all sorts of in-kind benefits like housing, for example. And, and so actually after the privatization, you might have said that there were actually large PR costs to that privatization, right? And, and those are costs that could be anticipated. And so I would say that the first wave of SOE privatization from all that we can see, both in terms of the writing about it ahead of time and the subsequent consequences economically, there were actually, you know, I think a gen there was genuinely a pursuit of an increase in productivity and a prioritization of GDP growth, right? It was a sort of market liberalization. Um, I think, of course, you, like I said, you know, um, legitimacy and the sort of maintaining of, of Rhetoric is a big part of all states' objective functions. I just think that for that particular wave of SOE privatization, to me, when I look at the data, it seems the weighting of objectives was more toward prioritizing genuine economic growth and um, maximizing productivity. Thank you, Thomas, for the question. Um, we have another question from Juan. Uh, is there, can we think of a parallel with other countries with oversized public sectors, not necessarily SOEs, but other government employments that potentially see the same phenomenon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that what I hope is that many of you at stages in your research career, if you're interested in this sort of thing, start to look for these types of questions, right? And um, if we look around the world, countries with very large public sector employment, Brazil, Argentina, and Russia as well, um, the exact types of non-GDP concerns that governments face may take different forms. So for example, in, in Brazil, there are lots of great papers like um, a previous questioner asked about political business cycles, 
and about the allocation of jobs after an election win via patronage. Those are all allocations of jobs based on political incentives. It just so happens that those political incentives are about re-election or maintaining coalitions within a democratic state, right? But the underlying principle is the same. It's just that it's going to take different shapes in different polities because the political incentives in those polities are a little bit different. So it, the extremely short answer to your question, I would say is definitely yes. <laughs> Feel free to ask more questions in the chat, both uh, in chat and Q and A. But in the meanwhile, I also have another question with regard looking forward in the um, kind of the future of China and SOEs. I see from the market that there is a there was once a privatization wave back in the nineteen at uh, the late uh, at the turn of the century. But now seeing that uh, China is facing a lot of barriers to further GDP growth, including um, seniorization, including um, just gradual slow growth in terms of production. Do you think that there will be more incentives uh, for China in the future to um, engage in more privatization of SOEs or taking more consideration into the productivity aspects of SOEs with its economic aspects more so than for the political um, effects? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And and I think what's what's really interesting is that my toolkit, while I'm not in the business of doing forecasting or making predictions, I can tell you what I'm seeing in the data and in the qualitative, qualitative evidence, right? Um, so right now, there's a softening of GDP growth in China that um, started in like 2014-15, and of course, COVID-19 has certainly not helped. Um, and there's this also the sense in which the levels of Chinese income are now moving from you know, low income to sort of a middle income country. And then there's this question of the growth model of you know, six to 8% annual GDP growth, a sort of wholly export driven um, economy, that's not a model that's going to translate into the next 10 or 20 years, right? So even though I'm not in the business of making predictions, you know, the, the speeches made by the leadership and really just common sense are telling us that um, China is going to think about alternative growth models um, relative to the ones that have worked since 1979 to now, right? We're sort of at an inflection point. And so already what we see is that since 2015 and 2017, there's been both a rise in the absolute number and the economic share of explicitly state-owned firms, but also an increase in the state's influence over the private sector. And you can, you can read the news and hear all sorts of examples of that, right? And, and again, you know, um, SOEs are not the only way that the Chinese government interacts with the economy, right? They do so with policy. They can do that by um, engaging with private firms. And I definitely see, you know, empirical evidence of, of that being a slight inflection point in the change in the trajectory. We have another question from Caroline about specifically the data you have on the SOEs. Do you have high confidence in the accuracy of these data that you can access? Um, she has concerns about the accuracy and quality of Chinese data in general, since um, we we do have a lot of censorship in China. Um, just yeah, that's a that's a great thoughts. question. So, so when you in any single context in the world, you have to think about measurement error. But in certain polities, measurement error might actually be systematic, right? If measurement error is classical. Any regression you run, it's just going to decrease the precision of your estimates. And I think what this questioner, Caroline, is asking is, what if there is non-systematic measurement error because of the incentives of local leaders to report certain growth figures or employment figures? And my answer is, it's actually an art to figure out how best to measure things. And for me, that's one reason I rarely, if ever, use county statistical yearbooks or provincial statistical yearbooks or the China statistical yearbook to do my analyses and argue that that is the end all be all of empirical evidence. And that's because 
Those are the headline numbers that are heavily publicized and that many people's jobs depend on getting a certain level. So I actually always interpret those um, with caution because of all of the political incentives that are behind the creation of those numbers, right? Um, like Carson Holtz uh, has done a lot of work about the measurement issues here and the Brandt et al. paper also show that. But what I will say is that for this paper, that's why I don't use you know, official statistics. I use household surveys. And it's just not obvious to me why a regular person, they wouldn't even be necessarily aware of these pressures. You just have someone um, showing up at your house and saying, where do you currently work? And you're like, oh, well, you know, I work on the farm or like I work at this company and, you know, it's just this SOE down the road. And those are not the people where the incentives are to misreport. That's, that's my argument. And so um, when you think about the data generator process, you have to think about what is the agent relaying that information. And so what I would say is that the patterns I find show up across a host of different data sets, but the sort of the one that I hang my hat on is a household data set where the incentives to misreport just do not seem to be biased in favor of me finding the result that I find. Uh, the second part to Caroline's question, I guess it's also very good to conclude our uh, um, discussion today. Um, Caroline asks, what would you recommend as good resources to understand more about the Chinese government and economic development there? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me turn around on my bookshelf. So um, Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics by Yasheng Huang is fantastic. Um, I actually really like just in terms of nonfiction narrative, Peter Hessler's books, you know, Country Driving. I, I read a lot of not explicitly economics books to just understand the context better and get a sense for what human dynamics are in play. Um, and then, you know, if you want in my dissertation, a lot of the papers that I cite in my lit review are precisely the papers that influenced and inspired me. So I think that would be a repository for this sort of thing. Great, thank you so much. Thank you again, Professor Wen, for such a wonderful presentation as well as such detailed Q&A. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone again that our next speaker series is on Friday, April 8th, at our normal time, 12 p.m. Eastern time with Professor Lawrence. The title is Behind the Curve, can manufacturing still provide inclusive growth? We hope you'll join us and thank you for joining us today.